wait one second. Okay, darling, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Danny Henderson, a spiritual therapist.com. Today's deck, today's guest, today's desk, today's guest is the great and one and only Chris O'Connor. Some of you have seen him before, some of you may never have. This man is a legend in my mind <laughs> and my lunchtime. Uh, he's such an impressive man, a beautiful, very close friend of mine. Um, somebody I love very much and I'm so proud to bring forward on my small but mighty channel with information that I have never heard in my entire life. And for his information, neither have some of you. In brief, this man was taken, abducted at two years old and he was put through a, 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 a process known as age advancement. He ended up in a military program off planet. So believe me, the earth militaries are well aware of the off-planet programs. A lot of them are known as secret space programs, but they're not secret anymore because the, the limits that kept information like this, the 50-year secret, you know, confidential top secret, um, you know, NDAs people signed and agreements, they are obviously dismantled at this stage. And so lots of people are now coming forward and sharing their own true life experiences um, because that's what they've gone through. Chris O'Connor, I'm going to bring you straight on, my love. Hello and welcome, sir. Hi, it's such a pleasure to be back to see you again, Danny. You know, I love you so much. And, you know, I know we, uh, I got, I got a lot of feedback from when we did that live when I was in Costa Rica with you. Um, people just love that, you know, our energy together. So, you know, it's, it's so nice to connect with you again. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's great. We, we, we know that we're definitely brother and sister from another oh, yeah. sister. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, down the old timeline so and again you know for people out there who are coming into their own awakening into their own disclosure no, no matter what level it might be um it doesn't always have to be about extraterrestrials or military there's also medical pharmaceutical there's all these other you know realms and, and avenues that we've all kind of been down and we've all come together now as a collective and we've all found and are connecting with each other again what a yeah. beautiful time to be alive and to support our brothers and sisters out there you lovely lot oh yeah um, now, you mentioned briefly that you came to visit me here in Costa Rica in the jungle, yeah. Yeah. and you came because you wanted to have some deep, deep past life regression and some intensive therapy sessions with me that include yes. some deep clinical hypnotherapy, yes. because you have so many buried memories, which a lot of super soldiers or secret space program military personnel have had done. It's very difficult for a lot of them to actually access those memories because of the brainwashing and mind control that happens with these personnel. And we were able to uncover some of your yeah. memories of that time. So may I just hand the floor to you? Can you give us a brief synopsis for those that haven't heard what happened to you at two? And then just take it wherever you feel led, my darling. Okay. <laughs> um, essentially, uh, I, was, I was two years old. I was born in 1968. Uh, so about 1970, um, I, I was taken, you know, and when I, when I say taken, I was taken by, I don't know if it was necessarily Air Force or the Navy, but it was one of those organizations. And I was age advanced through a, a process um, that they use uh, a, um, essentially, you know, it, 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 it's an amazing technology, obviously, and it, it was a, a technology given to um, us to the uh, United States through trade with uh, another race um, of, of we call them aliens, but there are a lot of technologies that we traded with them. And, um, and, and what that does is they can come in and they can take, in my case, a two-year-old child and place you in a, what is essentially a large acrylic tube. And there's this pink gel inside of it, like a pink purple gel. And that gel is actually um, sourced from uh, another alien race. And it's a bio gel. And that bio gel is grown in part with your DNA. So they take a DNA sample and then they grow this gel, enough gel to place you in it. And you're essentially drowned in it. And, um, and then you're suspended with um, like large needles that go into certain parts of your body and your bones. Um, to get that gel in there. And what that gel does is it stimulates uh, cellular growth exponentially. 
And so in a period of about, I don't know exactly, honestly, I don't know how long it took about, I think it was four or five weeks. I went from two years old to my mid twenties. And then once I was in my mid twenties, uh, they were able to uh, unlock through another series of technology, unlock uh, my memories of agreeing to do this prior to being born. So I went, before I was incarnate, I signed a contract to work with the, the what we call the SSP now. Um, and so they bring those memories back and all the memories that are applicable to the job that they were gonna have me do. And that was work with other alien races on a ambassadorial type of um, level. And Can so that's- a question? Yeah, of course. Sorry to interrupt, because I know people's minds are gonna be racing. Now you mentioned the biogel that was mixed with your own DNA, which helped in the progression, age progression. Right. Do you know the composite materials that went with your DNA? Do you know what the composite materials were that made up that pink biogel? I, I don't. Um, I, I've not given that much thought, uh, but all I know is it was sourced from another planet. Uh, it, was, it was incredibly expensive um, because they sourced it from another race. And they didn't use that method with, with everyone, um, just certain targeted people. And I just happened to be one of them. Um, other, other methods they use and they would grow, um, they would grow clones and that would take a quite a bit longer at times. Do you know the race of aliens or extraterrestrial species? And do you know the name of the planet? I do not, I never have known that, never have brought that memory through. Okay. All right, darling, continue. Well, I don't know, where was I? <laughs> Just the fact I, that you are now in your 20s after being oh, age progressed, age advanced. Right. Yeah, um, and then basically what my job was uh, to do was there was a lot of you know, research to be done and I unlocked a lot of memories. So I already knew a lot of what it was I needed to do as far as what they were asking me to do. And that was work with memory extraction and consciousness extraction from a physical form and most often temporarily placed in storage up to a couple of weeks. You couldn't store memory or, um, or consciousness for longer than that, they would begin to degrade. Um, but then uh, they would put them in either, a, well, a clone, of course, not, um, but they also had other forms that they would place them in. But um, uh, with, with me, it was, they had uh, a clone of myself and they kind of kept it and they could put it in stasis. So if I was in there for say 10 years, I'm now 35, they would have that clone to remain about that age because if something happened to my physical body doing the work I was doing, then they could, if they could, hopefully they could immediately move my consciousness, remove it, put it in the new clone and it would just I would continue on. Um, and that it did happen actually. Um, after about 20, a little over 20 years, you know, I was, um, I, I was injured uh, and I was going to die and there was nothing they could do. So they moved my consciousness. And so instead of being 45, I was now again, about 25 years old in a clone, but, uh, but it was a biological clone. It's not a clone that's developed uh, with AI. It's, it's literally, it, it's you. It's just a second version of your physical form. And then you're, consciousness and memories are extracted from the old form and put in the new clone. And then you just continue forward. You literally have all the memories generally. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. I wanna know how did you get injured badly enough that you were facing death in your first body? And secondly, when you wake up as this 20 year old man from being a two year old little boy that went to bed, did you realize that that had happened to you? Not at first. They had to first unlock those memories because, you know, memories are cellular and based on your DNA. Mm -hmm. And when you know how to unlock them, which they did and they do, um, then your memory of who you are and who I was and the fact that I, this was just one out of many, many, many thousands of lifetimes, all those memories came back, you know, and so I, it wasn't an issue for me because I remember choosing to do this prior to being born. I just had to be physically born on earth mm -hmm. for that process to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how did you get injured? 
I don't remember the, the details of it, um, but it was uh, some issue with conflict with another race uh, during negotiation. And uh, I just remember being uh, being in a scuffle in a conference room and it was it wasn't physical contact. The contact that happened was it was more of an energy contact, like a beam of energy came from this one entity and and just slammed into me. I believe it was about this area on my left my right shoulder. But it, because it was an uh, energy weapon, it was a biological energy weapon. It, I remember it coming directly from them, like their chest. Um, and it came right out of them and hit me. And the reason they, they hit me was because they were trying to get everybody. I just happened to be the first one. Um, and it was because the, there are different factions in what we call the SSP, Secret Space Program. Some of those factions aren't the nicest and they conquer and take planets and other civilizations over in the in the search for you know minerals or crystals or fuel or whatever it is that they need and part of my job was to go in there and renegotiate and apologize and, and at this time i was with the united nations i wasn't united states specific anymore i was actually representing the whole planet not not just the u.s and so I had to apologize, you know, and try to get through it. But there was some attitude with, because uh, I, I wouldn't be the one that was doing the negotiating. I was the one that could communicate back and forth with the other entities on a sometimes psychic, sometimes verbal, visual level. And I would just try to tell my people that I was under that, in fact, you know, you're really upsetting these people. You need to tone your, you know, change your tone or, or change your wording, or, you know, so I would report to them. So they were with me and, um, and they wouldn't, they were copying attitude and that, um, and they were copying attitude because the other race of aliens had a very, um, what would you call it? A, um, they had no emotion, you know, and so they were very matter of fact. Um, but they were angry, so they had emotion that was basically only anger at that time because, as I recall, we, as a human race, in their eyes, had attacked their planet and killed some other people. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So just for those people, because what's happening on our planet is so many people are learning about, you know, the different systems, the different institutions, you just named one, um, and they get very triggered because they've heard that these things are infiltrated, which we know they are. Mm -hmm. For those that now may be switching off because you mentioned United Nations and there's little or no trust for some people, myself included, um, in that, can you please uh, explain the difference between the off-planet um, system, United Nations, that you were ambassador for at that time? Yeah, um, there's, um, you know, the, the, what, what we know is United Nations have connections to off-planet United Nations uh, issues. In fact, I, um, as, as I said, I was part of that. We really didn't report in to Earth too much. We were, you know, we really truly were, at least my group, were truly there to save Earth because they, there are some races that wanted to just wipe us out, mm -hmm. you know, um, just because of some of the, the bad things that some of us were doing. And, and you know, when you look at a whole race, of people like we, we we use the term um the orions or reptilians we immediately think the entire race is bad but that just isn't true it's just like with humans not all humans are bad so even in a, an organization not all of the organization is bad you know and that includes governments as well you know you have different factions and um, and that's we were on the side of trying to repair some of the damage that was being done. Okay, so that's how you got injured, basically yes. energy weapon. Now you in real life, you are a big man. You're a big dude. You are a solid hunk of chunky burning love. Sorry, I got distracted there for a minute. <laughs> oh, you are a beautiful big giant of a man. You're like six foot four, solid, muscular. Um, were you the same physical um, way you are on the planet? Were you the same physical kind of, you know, being off planet? Yes, this is the same DNA, same body. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
So um, is there anything else in that little, not little, but that realm there? Because we've got so much to cover. We want to bring yeah. people information, but in bites. So it's mm -hmm. not overwhelming and they can sit back and they can think about whether or not this yeah. resonates, whether or not they believe it, you know, uh, because yeah. when you're just firing information at people and it's, it's a program, um, and there's someone out there doing a really useless job of it right now um, to a disinfo agent um, mm -hmm. who doesn't stop talking and is overwhelming in all the subjects. And what that does, it shuts down people's ability to stop yeah. and think and breathe. And when the person has no emotion as well, I mean, this is very much, in my opinion, this being um, that's, that's kind of putting it, this information out at the moment um, is part reptilian. That is extremely clear um, yeah. to me. But, you know, others will either come to see it or they won't, you know. Right. Um, yeah. So let's make sure we've taken care of that particular skirmish where you physically lost your body. Then you mm -hmm. were put into your second clone body. Uh, well, that would be my first clone, mm -hmm. uh, because that that body at that time was the original that I was born with. It just was aged man. So um, about twenty years into it, because I signed three twenty year contracts with uh, with that organization, and um, so I was back at 25 again then i then i worked for about another 20 years on my second contract i had already signed my my second contract but um but it was about 20 years later before my second contract was up and i was going to sign a third so part of my negotiation with the third 20 years was i wanted my 25 year old body back again. it was kind of a you know i didn't have to have it but i, I wanted it back <laughs> who doesn't want to go back to their 25 right, mid 20s exactly. right uh, so that was a egoic thing, but I did do that. Um, and so that was my uh, third clone. So yeah, so I was my third clone uh, because I had, had the, the original, then a, then a first clone with injury, the second clone um, uh, was what I wanted to go back to. And I ended that one and then they created a third, uh, third clone of my two-year-old body again so they could return me back to where I left in time. Mm -hmm. So as if I, there's no perception of loss of time for my being gone. Do you have a way to explain in brief, although it's a massive subject, but a way to explain in brief to people that cannot get their head around time warps, wormholes, jumps, um, how it was that you were in bed and yet you wake up in the morning on the planet as a two-year-old little baby boy, but really there's been all this 20, 40, 60 year programming happening right. in real time off planet? Well, it's fairly easy when you have the technology and the knowledge uh, to, to skip timelines. Um, it's, uh, it's just basics as far as uh, quantum mechanics and using photonic vibration and the speed of light. And when they, you know how to travel at 99% the speed of light, there's a formulation in how to exit that, that your direction of speed, so you're heading between here and the center of, of our galaxy in a straight line. You're going at the speed of light and there's a certain formulation of when you wanna exit that timeline. And then, so you do it at that angle. So like you're exiting a freeway, you exit that freeway at a certain angle, then you bet you're basically back in time and then they just come back to earth. Thank you so much again, just to slow down for a moment, just yeah. to help people get their head around that. Um, I watched, um, of course, our friend, Dr. Michael Sala. He recently did a brilliant, well, all of his broadcasts to me are brilliant. There was a particular man, I think his name was Andrew, Andrew B, Andrew Bellagio. But this man was sharing how his father um, had access to time jumping and would take his son with him. And uh, there's a very famous photo of an event that happened with the president way down the timeline in our apparent history, where this little modern child is photographed walking around. And it turned out that that was Andrew. That was wow. him. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I never heard that. that. Yeah, so again, because we've got so much information to get through, and you and I have already done three, four 
different broadcasts together. We've covered the different types of Sasquatch, where they came from. Mm -hmm. We've covered Jesus reincarnated. We've covered other um, alien or external extraterrestrial species. We've covered many different gentle subjects together. Well, I'm getting energy whack here. Um, and now we're moving more into uncovering memory because our brothers and our sisters out there, no matter what they've been through on or off planet, coming into their own cellular awakening, mm -hmm. their own true memories, not screen memories, not memories that are designed to plug in to lead you down a path of fantasy, but to really love yourself into coming into that awareness. Would you like to go to the treatments that we did together? Um, I would, uh, but just prior to that, um, I would like to make one comment because I, I, you mentioned memories and the whole purpose for my doing this is to help others accept the fact that they are having memories, that, that they're not crazy, that they're not dreams. They could be some dreams, but you know the difference when you know the difference, mm -hmm. you know, um, and you don't have to believe me. You just have to hear me so that you can begin to remember who you truly are. Now, as a slight caveat to that, you and I were walking on the beach during my visit during this process, and we were talking about people not understanding the difference between a memory that is theirs and a memory that they're connecting to in the Akashic Records. And that's something I have to do with every one of my memories is to, is to look at it, kind of absorb it, marinate with it, and try to concentrate and understand if this is truly a memory that I experienced whether it was an SSP or a past life or what, or, is, or am I connecting with a file in the Akashic Records and I'm experiencing someone else's memory? And though some people that think they may be a, a famous figure from the past, they may only be reading that file, you know, on, on a psychic level. And they're connecting to that file, which is amazing if they can do that. But, you know, but it's important that we step back and marinate those memories to make sure it's our memory or is it a memory that we're retrieving from a hall of records essentially that's a very very highly important point again to let people just go breathe into their body and calm down because when we see something or feel something it's so shocking or like oh, wow and then we have this instant recall but like you say let's make sure that that recall belongs to us and our energy frequency or have we jumped into a different lane that belongs to somebody else, which often right. can happen. Yes, yes. So you came here, I Costa did. Rica, yeah. and we had some very, very deep, deep, intense sessions together, hours we and did. hours. Yes. And so I would just like to invite you just to whatever you are comfortable sharing, because this is your true life story. Um, please go ahead. Well, um, gosh, there's so much. Uh, is there is there a, a one particular that, that comes to your mind that you'd like me to touch on that you think that people would be best? Because then we don't have a lot of time here. I think really the most important thing now is for you to find the memory that comes to the fore because you went down so many different timelines and so many different roads. Um, I do remember one thing that you said. I remember you saying, oh my goodness, Earth is the center of the universe. In that oh, right. moment, that's somewhere that you went, whether that's true or not, or you were just in that juncture and that was what was coming to you, whether it's the actual, you know, total truth. I mean, let's maybe start there. Yeah, I do remember that. In fact, I remember that again yesterday um, and this morning. So maybe that's something we're supposed to mention. Definitely. Um, that you have to understand space time, <laughs> which is a little bit of a trick, um, but we all exist in a three-dimensional space and the earth also, of course, exists in a three-dimensional space um, in a certain time. And when we look at the whole of the universe as we know it, what we consider the big bang, which is the original thought that created the universe and where all things came into existence, and then expand it out from there. So that point, what makes Earth so attractive to so many other races 
one of the reasons, other than the fact that we're, you know, like 22 different races blended together and we're a giant experiment, um, that the physical location of where the Big Bang occurred is where Earth resides. So like within the orbit of the Earth. So that would include the Sun, the Mercury, and, you know, a couple other planets. So basically, we kind of are the center of the universe in a geographical location. Um, and so that makes it very interesting for other races as well. And so that information came through to me um, at that time as a, as a memory, actually. And that one I thought was really interesting. I don't know that it really will have any profound effect other than for people understanding how it works. You know, as far as the expansion of the universe, we kind of were where it began. Mm -hmm. Another memory that came to you um, around that same moment uh, was Earth 2. Oh, right. Yeah, that, um, that was another planet that we would refer to as Earth 2. And to the best of my recollection, when I visualize it on a map, because I remember seeing star maps, is basically where Beetlejuice is. Was uh, and I believe that's where we, what we referred to as Earth one, two, and three, and um, what well, we call it. Well, ours is one and two and three and four because we had an outpost on a third, so we didn't really refer to that one as as the third one. So otherwise, it'd be Earth one, two, three, and four. Um, so Earth two would be the primary planet within the system of, uh, of Beetlejuice, uh, where we have other humans living, uh, Earth humans. Okay, so this is really, 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 really big, and it could be confusing. So we need to really take care of this information. So people okay. choose not to freak themselves out, not to go down a rabbit hole, that we just relax and we just listen to the information that you're bringing. Okay, doesn't mean they have to hang on to it like it's gospel. But it's really interesting the things that you've experienced. Now, a lot of people don't know what Beetlejuice is, so I'm just going to very quickly give a synopsis on that. Guys, most of us know where Orion's belt is, and Chris, if at any moment I'm wrong, then you better guide it in, but this is just what I know. So you look at Orion's belt, one, two, three, you've got three stars, one slightly goes off to the left, and those, that star map is mapped out on our planet with the great uh, pyramids at Giza. They go mm. one, two, three. They're in alignment with Orion's belt. So if you go outside and you look up at the sky and you see the three stars, one, two, three, go to the middle star, mm -hmm. the middle star, that's where the Egoroths live. Our beautiful annex lives there. That's where they're from. Take that middle star and then trace from the middle star, trace it to the far left. Okay, middle star of Orion's belt, mm -hmm. far left-hand star, that is right. Beetlejuice or Battle Guys. It mm -hmm. looks like a kind of a pinky hue. In right. the 70s, we were told it's an old sun, it's about to blow up. That is where we are told the double stargate, mm -hmm. where the nefarious reptoids and greys have been coming in and out. It is one of the most sought after areas in our solar system. Please correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's correct. That's why uh, we moved there. It was, uh, was part of the trying to negotiate access to that and if necessary, fight for it. So you're saying there is an, uh, you're saying there's an Earth 2 there. At and, an Earth, and an Earth 3. There okay. are two Earth, and then there's an outpost as well. Now, do those Earth 2 and Earth 3 look like our planet? Very similar. Um, I don't remember Earth 3 so much, but Earth 2, you, you'd have thought it was the same place. And it's located in front, beside, is it screened off? Like, how can we find that Earth 2? Um, I mean, as far as being able to see it, you know, we don't, well, common folk don't have the ability to, you know, to look for it with any technology that we have right now. It's, it's just a small planet. It's not as big as Earth. Um, so, but it's there, it, it's rotating the, I, I don't know what the rotation rate is because I don't remember all the details of the memories. I, like I said, I looked at, I remember star maps because I'm a visual person. 
So names and things like that don't really stick with me as well, but I can, I can remember things really well visually. And, and entering that star system, you know, from where Earth would be and we're heading kind of away from the center of the galaxy at an angle. Um, and you're coming into what we call the Betelgeuse, that sun. Um, it would be, again, like the second planet what, was what we would land on. And that would be what we refer to as Earth 2, though there was a proper name. There was a number in the name. I don't remember what this was. We just called it Earth 2. Okay. I'm just saying there's humans there, just like here on Earth. Just like here on Earth. They're, yeah. they're from Earth, yeah. Yeah. So, so what's it to say that we're not actually Earth 2? could be uh i've learned just not to say no to anything till i know you know yeah. um because we all have just a piece of the puzzle we don't have the whole puzzle mm -hmm. yeah. and so there are a lot of people that think in this ascension time that there's two earths and a load of us are gonna we're gonna get on the good ship jerusalem and you know bugger off somewhere and you know there's a lot of different stories and layers of stories mm -hmm. designed deliberately designed to confuse and corrupt the minds of the sweet many. And for those that, you know, hold their hats on, you know, names like the New Jerusalem, our beloveds upstairs would never, ever, ever name a ship after a city or a movement or a religion or anything like that. It is a trap and we know it. And it's, it's tragic and terrifying to listen to people talking about it. Um, and, you know, again, to kind of guide people into, if you are still someone who is just looking for a leader, whether it's a government, a president, a God, someone to come and save you like that, then you are still in that mind program, that MK Ultra program, that you cannot do anything on your own. You cannot source yourself with your own beingness. And that's exactly what you've done, my darling. You've mm. worked so hard to gather your own evidence for self. And we listen to everything everything's there to be listened to yeah we gotta go inside we gotta go right. inside um chris i need you to remember something when i'm in those sessions with you i'm holding space i'm right there mm -hmm. then i delete everything i don't hold on to anyone's memories at all it's not right. it's i see too many people so i don't have instant recall to your memories of those days that we spent together right. here as well just so I remind you of that fact. Yeah, and in fact, I didn't have a lot of memories. You know, we 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 did audio audio recordings I did on my phone, and I went back at later and listened to them. And I had no memory of recalling those memories during that during some of those sessions. So I totally understand, and I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just didn't know if anything yeah. stood out. Yeah. You know, um, that it was in of interest in particular. Um, but we did visit the Saturn station. Uh, during one of uh, my sessions. And in that session, um, I learned a lot more about a memory I've had since I was you know, a little child um, about speaking you know, to uh, the Confederation of Planets and uh, actually trying to calm one of these races down that were ready to go to war with, against us, Earth. Um, again, because of what another faction of what we call the SSP was outdoing. Um, and they were ready to pull out of the Confederation. And so it was a really big deal. So I was, I was sent there because I knew who these other races were and knew how to work with them. And that was my job. So I was sent there and um, with, a, with a security detail from um, you know, some organizations from Earth to try to calm the situation down. And they all knew I wasn't gonna lie to them, you know? So, you know, I went there and ended a program. And uh, I don't know if you recall uh, during that session, how I remembered typing in a security code uh, to end a program that was begun by this other faction of our Earth SSP. Um, and I, I later remembered that that was, uh, part of the DNA program because my DNA had been used to create another race of people uh, that that was they weren't supposed to do and they were sneaking around doing it. So because it was my DNA, the only person that could end the, literally end the program basically shut it down because it was computerized 
had to be my DNA to literally punch in. You know, this is this high technology and you have to understand how high technology works. We don't have time here to explain that. Yeah. Um, but uh, during that session, I was able to recall the memory of shutting that program down. And then afterwards went and spoke in front of several hundred people in a large conference room on the space station and they rings inside. So on the space station, inside the rings of Saturn. Can you please go into more detail? What density dimension, how did it get there? Who built it? And how come no one ever talks about this particular subject? Well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I know there, there are a lot of other space stations that you know, people have spoken of. Um, but I do know that uh, this particular space station looks like the Death Star in Star Wars. I mean, that, it's just round, big giant round ball. It's, I don't know, it's gotta be miles across. Um, and it's, uh, it's built and moved into an, a, a high seventh, low eighth density vibration. And when you understand uh, high technology and using vibration to move from densities and dimensions, um, then you understand how you can have something right in front of you, but because it's vibrating at the wrong level for it, a third density 3D Earth person can't see it. Even though it's right right there, you can't see it because you're not part of it. It's too high of a vibration. Um, and so it's built and it resides in that eighth density vibrational state. So if, if say an Earth ship was gonna go visit this station, they have um, these, well, they have the engines to get there, whatever type of engine they have, they have several kinds. But once you're there, you switch on another engine that creates like a electromagnetic skin around the whole ship. And it moves that ship into another vibrational state, which is equal to what vibrational state the station is at. And then suddenly it appears in front of you and you can dock with it. And then you're, you're residing within it. So, you know, as an entity, you move in with the ship because the whole ship's being moved into that vibration. And once you're on the space station, then you're within that vibrational state and then you remain there. Um, so it, it feels very strange and different to reside in those vibrational states, but um, that's why they ionize the air and they do other things to uh, kind of make it compatible for as many different races as possible because that's a meeting place. As a being, Chris, who has had other lifetimes and other densities, dimensions and vibrations, do you think potentially it was easier for you to acclimatize to the, the rings and Saturn at that density or vibration because you already had recall in your cellular memory because every lifetime records no matter where we've been, who we are, how yes. high up we've gone up the scale. Do you think that's a potential? Yes, that's one of the reasons I was chosen. You know, so a lot of people that you say, well, why would they choose you um, or me or you, whoever? It's, it's generally because of the totality of their lifetimes and what they've experienced and what they can bring back memory-wise, as you say. Like when I mentioned earlier about when I was age advanced from two to mid-20s, then they bring my memories back. Well, then I remember how to do all those things. I remember how to thought travel. I remember how to do all of that. I still remember how to thought travel. I just can't physically do it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it, it is about you know getting into that same state. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And uh, in your understanding and your actual real life knowledge um, and your real life, uh, real time experiences that you've had, how many densities are there? Well, there's eight master densities. Uh, then the end of the eighth is basically you start the beginning again. But within each density, you have an infinite number of sub densities and dimensions. So people, and I guess really confusing because people hear that they're 12th density, 15th density. Well, they probably are, but within what master density? You know, so we're currently in three third master density as Earth is currently experiencing it. And within the third density of Earth, we've actually, I'm sorry, I misspoke. We're in technically now we're in fourth because we're in transition, but the Earth itself is in fourth. We as humans are 
transitioning from third to fourth. So you have a lot of variations of density within one master density. And then within each sub density, you have seven other sub densities. So each density has sub seven sub densities. And then every dimension is the same. So one dimension in a density could be a hundred billion dimensions. And so when a person says they're, they're from 12th density, they, they most likely are, but we just also need to know what the master density they're from within that dimension. So wow. it's really confusing. It, it is very confusing. It is very confusing because there are people um, that we value very much um, who will say there's 12 densities maximum mm -hmm. to their knowledge, to then other people who have no experience but make things up um, are leading people down a very dodgy road and saying 15, 16, etc. So, you know, because there's so much disinformation happening in our beautiful awakening that we're all going through, mm -hmm. um, it's just nicer to bring another way of thinking and so that people that are watching broadcasts like this can stop and think. And I just am amazed that, you know, other broadcasters, they're not always questioning the person they're interviewing. Like it's time mm -hmm. to really dig in and yeah. take things apart. And if the person can't explain, then that's not a reality they've been to. It might have been something they read in a book or they've watched, you know, you or other people that we know and love and trust, you know, so I'm just personally very concerned about the fallout I'm witnessing um, with people that just don't know, bless them. I mean, yeah. I don't want to be a patronizing cow on this, but I'm like, oh my gosh, how someone can be so on a path for themselves and starting to unlock and learn who they are. And then they watch somebody else who's got different information. And then they're suddenly out there in that lower density draconian vibration coming back attacking and, and, and tearing down or trying to, you know, of yeah. course they can't. Um, but, you know, but they're in a loop, they're in a mind head, a mind messy loop, you know, and so yeah. I think that us sharing this intel on different levels and like, we'll give, we'll give some people a, a, a better fighting chance, you know, for yeah. themselves. Yeah, kind of just as long as, it, you know, I, I will just really quickly recap what I just said, because I know it's just so, it's yeah. hard for me to keep up. It's so mind blowing. But essentially, there are eight master densities, and every density has seven sub densities, and every sub density has seven sub densities, and it goes on with that in that manner infinitely. So if somebody says they're from the fifteenth density, they probably are. But we need, you know, but more information would be nice to know what master density they're a part of. So every density has seven sub densities and every sub density has seven. So it goes on infinitely that way. And it works the same way with dimensions. Okay, all right. Thank you so much for trying to be a bit clearer with that. Now let's go back to the space station on Saturn within the rings of Saturn um, that the people are like, well, how come the telescopes here don't see it? You've explained a little bit about that. You also mentioned in the previous broadcast that there is some kind of a distortion in one of the rings that no one's ever been able to figure to the, to the lay person. Of course, mm -hmm. others know, they just don't share it with us, but there's a distortion within the ring, one of the mm -hmm. rings, and that is where the space station is located, yes. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's correct. It just, even though it, it, it's in another vibrational density, it ripples through all the densities. And so there, there is just a slight, it's sort of um, like the movie Predator where it could disappear, but you could still sort of see the outline and a little bit of wavy weirdness. You know, it's clear, but it's not perfectly clear just because there's, you know, there's gravity um, to every density. And so you're slightly bending the light as it goes through. And that's what they're seeing with the distortion in the rings of Saturn. So what does the space station look like? Like, what does it look like? Size, shape, color. And who were the beings that you met on board? No, oh, there was a, a lot of beings. Um, it, like I said, it looks like um, the Death Star. It's a giant sphere, um, metallic. Um, it looks 
well, you can see a lot like a lot, lot like the Death Star from Star Wars with different. A lot of, you know, I, you know for me, I, I barely ever watch Star Trek or okay. Star Wars, so I would have to look that up like other right. people. So that's why I'm asking you to, you know. Okay, it, like I said, it's a giant metal sphere that has, you know, if you're looking from the top to bottom or bottom to top, it's just you can just see hundreds of levels. Um, um, just knowing because you can tell the levels because there are docking stations at all these levels, you can tell it's a different level. Although those levels are about 20 feet tall each uh, because there's a lot of really large beams that are on there as well. Some levels are much taller or even taller beams. Um, so, you know, it just depends where you're at. So, you know, uh, one level, it's like a, a master level in the center of the sphere you know, within this, not the center center, but the outside center of a sphere. Um, that is about 100 feet tall. Um, but it encompasses like two or three different levels and they're all very, very tall, you know, because that's where there's a gathering place. And so that way, very small beings and very tall beings can be on the same level at the same time. Mm -hmm. But um, there was like humans that were 16, 20 feet tall. Um, there were what we call Sasquatch, the, you know, that type of being, there were reptilian, there were insectoid, there were what we call grays. There's a, there's a lot of different beings within all of these master races i'll call them you know like humans I mean, how many types of humans are there I mean, and then so um and they're not all what we would consider positive but it was a gathering place for negotiation between races and planets so they're all there whether you want them to be there or not you know so it's that kind of a place but it was run with the intention the whole the whole uh, area was, is run with the intention of the betterment you know of you know, the universe and the galaxy in particular mm -hmm. and I, so not, go ahead. sorry not necessarily just there for the benefit of earth planet earth and the beings here it was a central gathering station a neutral zone if you will yeah. yes exactly the earth is important because um, we have so much attention, we're interfered with for so many years with so many different races, so they had to establish two or three outposts, two or three confederations or federations, um, with, even in our solar system, there's at least three or four that I know of, you know, um, and so there's like Jupiter's one there, there's, there's one Pluto, I mean, they're all over the place, you know, there's one in the, uh, what do you call the uh, asteroid belt? as well you know so that's the ones i know of okay let's not skip past pluto there's more and more information starting to come through of course it'll be the next big subject and topic for people i'm sure mm -hmm. but can you share what you know about the space station on pluto i don't remember because i mostly stayed in saturn um but i i have been there and i i just i know it exists and to be honest i haven't even considered trying to pull memories up from that place um but i just i just remember it being another gathering place but it wasn't a sphere it was literally on the on the planet itself when you were on the saturn space station and you're seeing all these beings some that you may never have seen before or didn't remember in this lifetime seeing before mm -hmm. were there any beings in particular that you were really overwhelmed by their love vibration in particular oh, yeah. Oh yeah, uh, the Andromedans, uh, or what I would call Arcturians as well. They're um, the, the Sasquatch race, actually, you know, because they're much more advanced now. And, and there's, there's factions with, with, within them as well. The ones that work with uh, this confederation are highly positive and really loving. And they're some of my favorite people. It's like Chewbacca from Star Wars. It's like, you can't help but love this big old guy, right? Mm. That's what they're like. Um, and then there were um, there's races that were, um, and I don't remember which race they belong to as far as planetary, um, but they were blue entities. I worked with them a lot. They were a coloration of like a Smurf, you know, the little Smurf cartoon characters, but they had iridescent, beautiful, shiny, pearly type of skin. And they were all clones of one another for the most part. Um, and they had like very straight white, white hair, like, you know, it not not like a blonde white, but like pure white. Um, so you have this stark blue and then pure white. 
Uh, then there are other beings that um, look like, uh, uh, well, we call them primates, but I mean, there's one in particular and I, my brain's kind of skipping it, but um, very kind of a long face, you know, monkey type of face. They're also very, very loving people. They love to wear human clothing. Um, there's something about human fashion just totally intrigues them. And <laughs> I had one visit from one, they would come and you always wear what we call like a zoot suit. You know, he was always perfectly made up and they're just, they're just so cool, you know. Um, and there were other, there were other races um, that looked, there's this one that looked like, um, had the, the nose area of uh, elephant seal. And then it, it, it would come up and then went around like this. So you had what looked like the hood of a cobra. And they were totally loving people, um, just so much love. Um, and then there were some energy beings that would uh, kind of come into form a little bit. And so you see these beings that are just like made of light or crystal. Um, and then there were other beings that were just like partially enclosed uh, light vapor or something. It's the only way I can describe it, you know, and, they, and, they, and they, they can change their form to help you relate to them as well. And so, you know, those, all of those beings were just, just, you can't even express the love. You just cannot express it. You know, it's just it's so overwhelming. Yeah. Oh, bless you, darling. Bless you. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. Let, let it come up. It's all good. It's all good. You're really gifting us. You're really gifting us with something special. And we thank you for it. Yeah. I love how sweet and loving and emotional you are. You know, you've never... The things that you've been through, the horrors, the, the horrific tortures, the terrible things, I'm just so happy that you've been able to retain your true essence, your ability to have unconditional love and recognition yeah. of, of love, darling. Yeah. Um, well, I just um, know that if, if people, you know, on earth could feel the love from these other entities, I'm not sure there's bad guys, you know, but when you connect with the true love of what the universe is really built on, we've been cut off from that you know and if we could feel it there would be no fighting there'd be no arguing there'd be none of that we would just move right into that space of love which is what we're currently doing so that's why i'm doing this and i'm trying to give hope and let people say you have no idea what's waiting it's beautiful uh, and it's so important that we move into the information that you have of the resonance because again there are people that are saying we're going from third to fifth which is a lie it's also a trap yes. um and i want you to speak more on that my understanding is and some of this came from you um that we cannot skip fourth fourth is the heart chakra moving into we cannot move into fifth without feeling fourth and someone yes. that tells you that is an ai or a bot, or a cyborg, or a trap. There's so many traps out there. So please, please give us the information. Yeah, you know, um, how it essentially goes when you're moving out of, like an intelligent race as human beings are considered, when you're advancing and you, and you begin to learn what's actually out in the universe and what you're actually a part of and what, what is actually true, that's when you move from a third density to a fourth density now the third density is awareness you become aware that there's a greater thing and that you're an individual and that there is love and that love is the key to all mysteries in the universe once you're aware of that you can now move into fourth density which is where we are right now and you have to experience fourth because not only can you be aware of love but you have to feel it you have to embrace it and learn what it is sometimes it's terrible and sometimes it's wonderful but you have to experience all the aspects all the facets that love offers and if you skip that because the, the next one you know the next level the fifth density is information and intelligence so you apply the lessons of love in an intelligent way if you skip fourth you skip the lessons of love and and negative entities, negative races don't see the purpose of love in advancement. So they skip it. And we can't skip it. We have to experience it. We have to experience it. Otherwise, 
you know, you're going off of base you know, of, of a limited information, you know, and, and, you're, and you'll have to experience it. You'll have to go backwards and experience it as an individual. So might as well get right to push time, move right into four. <clears throat> Just referring back um, to help people again, you know, go do some more reading up on certain things about yes. how we've actually got to these levels of understanding of the real history of Earth. Um, a man called David Hawkin, uh, he wrote a book called Power Versus Force. And on that is um, a grid, um, a set of numbers and frequencies, measurements, um, just for quick reference for people that might think, how do I find an image of this information? Uh, because we are told um, the different vibratory resonances of the human body, we're told that the energy, the frequency of love is measured at 528 hertz, 528 hertz. And there are uh, music and meditations out there. Some of them have been hacked now, sadly, but the 528 hertz is the frequency of love, which is really healthy for all of our cells, no matter what kind of coagulation some of the cellular clusters in unwell people might be, but running that frequency 528 through your biome is really, really healthy. Another number we're given, and please correct me if it's wrong, is that we were at one point all um, kind of harmonically, spherically um, attuned to the frequency 432. Yeah, I, I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. And yet the powers that are not have put us off kilt, that they've tried to make us go elsewhere. 432 is another healing sound healing uh, modality for us as we travel through this ascension as we're moving into fourth um, right. and then Nikola Tesla most famously his favorite numbers are three six and nine and uh, each of those numbers is a derivative of nine and he said that everything out there is harmonic is energy is vibration and three six nine is a beautiful starting place as an exploratory science-minded other or um, place for us to go as intelligent beings, because as humans, we are so incredibly intelligent. We are so beyond brilliant, but mostly we've been raised and told to this moment that we're not. Um, right. What can you share also about numbers, mathematics, um, spherical harmonics that might be of service? Well, that all things are vibration um, and you know, on a photonic level, all things are created from the vibration of the photon, or the photons even created from vibration, and that vibration is the vibration of love. And love is what we consider source or God or, you know, the creator is that thought. So everything goes back to love and to vibration. And so that's why that vibration is so incredibly important as a base of understanding, you know, and um, I don't, I don't, I don't have a lot of knowledge in, in as far as in the numbers are concerned and how how they act interact. Um, I'm more kind of the guy that gets in there with a the hammer and does the work, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. So I, I kind of know how things work, um, you know. But I've not been into the numbers too much. Yeah, that's all right. Just making sure as we kind of gently go through what you know how and help we can give um, people as they're coming onto their own brilliant journeys. You know, people right. are so smart. They're finding out so much. They're realizing so much, you know, and, and some of these conversations such as what you and I are having really help to fill in other areas and other gaps or, or elicit a thought like, oh, I'm going to go and look at David Hawkins work or, and I'm not espousing his work. I'm just saying that there's, there's a, a grid, um, a friend of mine who's passed on Dr. Sorrell, Dr. Mayu Soro Espinosa did a PhD on the back of Hawkins' work as a continuation of her own interest in that subject of power versus force and the vibration in the body. We all vibrate at different vibrations, um, mm -hmm. the lowest being anger, depression, grief, and then they come up a scale and each scale has a number. Um, and that's something else that I think people that don't know would be completely fascinated with yeah. Going back to your memories and our deep, deep therapy sessions together, um, you've already shared that you remembered that your DNA, your frequency key, was used to create um, in a space program, secret space program, clones 
um, that you went and you shut down. It's very yeah. important that, again, you know, people have hope that these are lots of things happening off planet, lots of programs being shut down, have been shut down, lots of dark energies, non-conscious, soul-less, heart-less, have been blocked, moved, taken. This is a reality. It's not a make up. We're not mm -hmm. writing a Star Trek episode here. This is actually happening on our planet. From that memory of your DNA being used in that way, is there anything else that you can remember directly from that or around that? Well, I remember that um, it, it, the program hadn't actually been enacted. Uh, it, was, it was on another planet and I don't know where that was because I didn't even know that this was happening. Um, and something about my particular frequency in combination to some others, um, they were able to take that and then create this cloning program for what would look like human, but they wouldn't really be human, uh, not, not in the same form. And I'm not saying that this is a good or bad thing. I'm just saying that it wasn't a good thing for the reasons they were doing it. Um, and that was part of why I had to shut this you know, program off. Um, and we were able to uh, do that because all program, well, supposed to be all programs with all of these. If you're part of the Confederation, you're supposed to report all things that you're doing. You know, and then that you do that through master computer and then so that, you know, all races, because it's there's no information that's supposed to be hidden. If you're part of the Confederation, every race can access whatever, you know, you put on master computer. And you're supposed to, if you're working interstellarly especially you're supposed to make those put in reports basically and say we're doing this on this planet for this purpose and what have you well they did that uh some of this earth-based uh program but they didn't give all the information and they and they created because you have to be able to create keys to um, access these programs um they're at the station uh base station and um and so what they did Let's say skipped information as to the fact that they were because it's it's not illegal because they can't tell anybody what to do but you know you kind of are there with an agreement not to create new races not to create new life you know that there's plenty of life already we don't need to do that you know sort of thing and so um can barely keep control of what we got so don't create new ones so they basically said that they were there harvesting minerals or whatever they said they were doing but really, it was um, they were creating a new race of, of entities, and um, and the way the master computer that they used was set up, um, you had to actually have the DNA base DNA uh, shut down that program. So that's what I did, and so that's how we were able to get kind of back out of that situation. You know, by saying, again, it was a, one of our factions. It wasn't the whole earth. It doesn't represent everybody on the planet. Um, and to show you in good faith, we'll shut the entire program down. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Confederation. I believe you mean the Confederation of Planets? Yes. Yeah. How is that different, for those that don't know, to the Galactic Confederation of Worlds or the Inter- Galactic Confederation? They're all basically the same master organization. They're just different chapters and they have different names. And different languages translate them slightly differently. Because a lot yeah. of people get very confused about yeah. those things. And there's also the Galactic Confederation of Light. Have you heard of yeah. that? And what is your thought? Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've heard of it. Um, and I've never gotten a good feeling from it. And that's about all I know. Mm -hmm. And what about the new ship or the new Jerusalem? What's your thoughts on that? I've never heard of it. Um, I, I've heard of it recently, um, but I've never, I, I don't have any memory based on that. I know that there are other ships, you know, there were arcs on Earth and other planets. And I've, you know, even though I'm bad with names, I think I remember New Jerusalem, but I don't know for sure. I just, it, it doesn't, sit, doesn't sit well with me. Yeah, it's a vibratory resonance, a 
a key yeah. that we all have that we can plug into to see what does that mean? Am I being led by my Christian programming, my earth yeah. programming? And if I am being led by that um, savior complex and that damn right people are going to plug into that, of course they are. Yeah. It stands to reason that's how we've been brainwashed and programmed. Yeah. All right. Um, and again, I mean no offense to anyone. You know, we're all on our individual journeys. Let's not fall yeah. apart. Let's not criticize. Let's not be down on ourselves and say, I'm an idiot because I believe that. No, this is all part of our individual unique journey, right? All yeah. of it, all the information is there. We'll go down one road. We might find another a bit more of a resonance or we might just go, nope, I believe that and I'm going to stay there. We get to do that. It's all right. Yeah. It's all free right. will. Totally. Um, you had two big revelations during and since the um, sessions that we did together. And one of them was fascinating. <laughs> it was, yeah, right, Sydney, we've got yeah, some more today. Um, one of them was on the term deja vu. Oh, right. Yeah, that was really a fascinating. <laughs> um, that uh, when we experience deja vu, you know, it's, it's got this huge mysterious thing, right? We know that there's something to it. But then we tell ourselves now there's nothing to it. Well, it turns out what I was what was shared with me very recently was that, and then it's important for people to know that deja vu is actually what we call a wormhole. And it's a wormhole because it's within our brain, it's within our thought. This is how all things become reality, is through our thought patterns. And so when we have deja vu. Say, we, say I have deja vu in this moment of this interview. And then 10 years down the line, or say, I, sorry, it's the opposite. Say 10 years ago, I had a deja vu of this interview with you right now. And then here I am in the interview and I'm like, oh, I remember this. I remember I had a deja vu moment 10 years ago about this moment. Well, what that is, is a wormhole connecting time, going through time and space, connecting you with yourself in the past so you're having that thought at the exact moment the same time so you're there is no time so you're living what is called duality outside of time and so deja vu moments basically are wormholes uh, of thought between you in two different periods of time that is wild that is wild. Well, I've got a lot of energy beaming, coming off my, or beaming, that sounds like so star tricky, but I'm feeling a lot of like, um, yeah, bounce off my, my uh, headband. I didn't normally get that. That's quite interesting that we're on this subject. Uh, maybe it's kind of an antenna. Um, so that's, that's beautiful. Thank you so much um, for explaining uh, the intel that came to explain more of the wormhole connection from a memory to an actual happening and then a catch up a catch-up point, a connection point yeah. of resonance. Uh, could you also please explain to us your thoughts on the Amua Mua? Oh, the object Amua Mua, yeah. Uh, that is actually a spaceship, you know, and I know that they, they're calling it an object still because, you know, how are they going to admit that it's a spaceship? They're not, at least not yet. Um, but that was actually built uh, at Teotihuacan in Mexico. And that that's actually... Um, it's built to look like a stone, a giant rock. Uh, don't know why, but uh, it's the Mayans. And when the Mayans um, built this ship, it was for interstellar space travel. And I don't know why they haven't come all the way back into the solar system, but I do know they've, they've made stops at some of the stations, uh, Pluto for one. And um, uh, there's another station in the... Uh, what you call the, uh, again, it's the uh, uh, asteroid belt. So they've made those stops, but they're not coming in to the, the central solar system at this time. I kind of really hope they do soon uh, because they're from here. You know, they're, uh, they built the ship at Teotihuacan. And you can look at the plazas and the pyramids at Teotihuacan. And um, there are, I think it's the pyramid of the sun or the moon. Uh, in front of it, there are cut off pyramids. So they're like pyramidal shapes, platforms that are cut off about halfway, so they're flat. Well, those were all points where the ship rested. And then they were entry points. In the very center in front of the pyramid, there was another one that came down. And that's, there are these stairways. And you wonder, you know, they were just platforms, but really they were 
platforms to enter the ship when they left. And, um, and, if, you, and if you're familiar at all with uh, how Teotihuacan was built, there, are, there were rivers uh, filled with mica or tunnels filled with mica and those were filled with mercury. And that was what the power system of the ship and how, what got it off the planet. And she's gone. All right, stop recording now. I hope.